headed out that direction. All right. As our kids make it out, let's continue in our time of worship this morning by praying and asking God to speak to us this morning through his word as he has uh, hopefully already started to speak to you and to your heart through the songs that we've sang, the words that we've been proclaiming to the Lord through music this morning. Father God, we come this morning with gratitude. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for sending Jesus to this earth to live the life that we could not live, to die the death that we deserve, but to rise again. And, and we, as the song sing, we, we proclaim it, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. We, we look forward to the return of Christ in his second coming. And so, Lord, we pray that until that day comes, that you would cause us to be your hands and your feet here on this earth, that we would live for you in gratitude and thankfulness for what you have done in us through the cross. And so, Lord, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, we pray that you would convict where there needs to be conviction, that you would bring hope where there is despair, that you would bring comfort where there is sorrow, that you would bring excitement to those who maybe are dull right now and kind of apathetic in their faith, Lord. We pray that you would speak, that you would change our hearts, that you would change our minds and help us to realize and help us to embrace who you are. And what you have done for us. And so, Lord, we are thankful. And we look forward to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it has been quite the last week and a half for, for me. Um, our family had the, the good fortune of being able to go uh, travel and, and take a little vacation, get a little time away. We went up to Branson, Missouri and had a, a wonderful time. And then... Uh, this weekend, a, a group of guys, we went out to Circle Simpsons Camp in Stanton for a men's retreat and had just an amazing time of being able to do fun things, uh, eat good food. Uh, they, they, they constantly said, this is a men's retreat. We will eat meat and we will do guns and we will do golf and, and all sorts of fun stuff. But, but even more important than that, there was a time of bonding and, and sitting under God's word and, and learning about some of the important things that maybe we just don't think about and, and participate in, in, in ways to grow in our relationship with God. And, and in some of those ways that they talked about was solitude, just getting away, away from all of the noise, away from all the distractions, Fasting, taking time maybe during the day or, or for a few days or for a week or for several days to put aside our fleshly need for food to spend time focusing on God and on, on his goodness and how he satisfies our needs even more than the food that our bodies crave and talking about diving deeper into God's word, but not just, not just reading God's word to check the boxes, but, but, but diving into God's word because it's through God's word that we draw closer to God. So it was a really uh, sweet weekend for us. And, and hopefully next year, uh, even more guys will, will come and, and be a part of that. But I know last week we were blessed to have Jeff come and, and be able to speak while I was gone. And uh, I really appreciated him and, and the way he talked about one of the, the key uh, ingredients of a Christian, humility. Humility. A, a follower of Jesus Christ would be marked by humility. You see, in order to have a proper understanding, and when we have a proper understanding of who we are in light of who God is, there's no room for arrogance. There's no room for pride when we have a proper understanding. 
You show me somebody who is arrogant and prideful and it's all about them. You have shown me somebody who does not have a right understanding of how much God has forgiven that person. How much God has blessed that person. As we've been looking through the book of Luke and we've followed the story of Jesus, we have seen time and time again the Pharisees come and be a part of that story. And and the Pharisees, they were arrogant, weren't they? They were arrogant people. They thought that they deserved God's blessings because they were the sons of Abraham. They were Jews. And so God owes me. His blessings. They thought that God owes me his blessings because I'm so righteous. And it had turned them into legalists who had become these nitpickers. And they were more interested in following their rules than about worshiping God rightly. And so every time we see this, we see Jesus. And Jesus is standing there and he's shaking his head. And he's saying, you simply don't get it. You're you're missing the point. You don't see me. In today's passage, in Luke 17, 20 through 27, in in verses 20 and 21, we're going to see Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And what we're going to see is him talking about the importance. Because what we see here, when we look at these passages, is is we're going to see the Pharisees kind of have one of those sayings where they've been listening to Jesus for a while now. And Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of God. And they've kind of gotten to the point where they're like, well... Maybe, maybe some of you have experienced that before in your life where somebody has told you something's going to happen and it keeps getting pushed down the line. And eventually, maybe you got to the point where you're like, well, is it going to happen? Maybe some of you are old enough to remember throughout the 80s and the 90s, there were a lot of books that were written about the end times. And that the world's about to end. And Jesus is about to come back. There are books everywhere about that. How many of you remember Y2K hysteria? Yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? Oh my gosh, the computers. ah! The hysteria of of when is it going to happen? And so Jesus, the second coming of Jesus... It's a very popular topic. Lots of people want to talk about the second coming of Jesus. Lots of people want to make money off talking about the second coming of Jesus. But what we will see here today is Jesus will say, I'm not about all the speculation. I want to give you some facts about my second coming. I want to give you the facts so you will know. All right? So that's where we're headed. Look at verse 20 and 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that you can observe. Nor will they say, Look, here it is. Or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. When is the kingdom of God coming? Jesus, when will you return Israel to its rightful place? Israel should be the top of the the mountain. When will God overthrow the Romans? These horrible Romans that rule us, when will he do it? You see, the Pharisees with all their scholarship, with all the time that they had spent reading and studying the Old Testament, they still didn't understand what God said. The law, the prophets, 
all of it irrelevant because they were looking in the wrong place. Have you ever been looking for something and it was right in front of you, but you were looking in the wrong place? You ever done that? I recently read a story about a guy who was famous, well off. A lot of people knew who he was. Very successful man. And he was looking for the woman of his dreams. And so this man went around and he dated a lot of really good looking women. Models. And he dated all these women and, and in short order, they were broken up. Because he'd lost interest in them. It wasn't until he was in a serious accident that he came to the realization that the woman that he had been looking for, the woman he wanted in his life, had been there around him the whole time. A woman that he came into contact with on a regular basis. A school teacher. Someone that was kind. Someone that cared about people. Someone that was patient. <laughs> someone that didn't care about his riches and fame but just cared about him. You see, he had wasted all this time chasing all these beautiful women when what he really needed was right in front of him. When Jesus addressed the Pharisees, he told them, you have been wasting your time looking for the wrong things. You have been looking for a Messiah to come to bring the military and to crush the Romans and to elevate Israel back into prominence. But you're wrong. You see, the kingdom of God is standing right here. You see, Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the kingdom of God. He is the kingdom of God. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to be like the Pharisees. We are looking for the external. We're looking for the things that we can observe. We are looking for the blessings of God. We are looking for heaven. We're looking for forgiveness. And all of those things are true of a Christian, right? We get those things, but that is not what we should be looking for. The thing that we need to be focused on and the thing that we need to spend our time and attention focusing on is Jesus. It's simply Jesus. If we got nothing else, if we didn't get forgiveness, if we didn't get heaven, if we didn't get the blessings, it's Jesus. This is what we should focus on. In verses 20 through, 22 through 37, what we're going to see is Jesus turning to his disciples, his followers, us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian today, he is talking to us. And he is going to give us six facts about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that started when Jesus came to the earth. And if you read in anything in the theological world, you will hear the term, the already, not yet. And what that means is the kingdom of God has already come in the person of Jesus Christ. But it is not yet fulfilled in its totality until the second coming. And so what we live in right now is the kingdom of God. It started when Jesus came to this earth and he ministered. But we won't realize the fullness of the kingdom of God until he comes a second time. And so that's what Jesus wants his disciples, his followers to understand. There are six facts that he's going to give us in order to understand the kingdom of God. The first one is you are going to long for the day. In verses 22 it says, And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Son of Man, most popular thing that Jesus called himself. He said, there are going to be a day when you want to see me physically here. But then he's going to say, but you will not see it. You will not see it. You see, ever since Jesus went back to heaven, people have been longing 
for Jesus to return. They have been longing for it. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever paid attention to how much sin is in this world? And as you look around, you go, I wish Jesus would just come back. Have you ever done that? Have you ever watched TV this week? And you watch all the nonsense that's going on on college campuses? And you see all these kids and these adults that are doing horrible things. And you go, how did we get so wrong? How did we get here? How are we, as a society, raising up kids that this is the way they think they should act? Do we ever look at all the violence and the crime and the abuse that's happening to kids and to women and to the immigrant and to the disabled and go, Jesus, just come back? Do you, do you ever do that? God has placed in the hearts of each one of his children, each one of his followers, this burning desire to say, Jesus, come back. I want to see you. I want you to come back and to fix this. All the wrongs of this world that we suffer through, come and fix it. Come back soon. But the question is, what is the desire of your heart? Is the desire of your heart today for the blessings, for heaven? Is it for forgiveness or is your heart's desire is just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. That's what I want. Number two, it's going to be obvious to everyone. In verse 23 and 24, we say, and they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and the lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in that day. Many like to claim that my relationship with Jesus, it's, it's, it's internal, it's spiritual, it's personal. In an aspect, it is. But what we've seen throughout the story of Jesus is that it's more than just personal. It's more than just internal. It is outward. It is physical. It demands something of a follower. From the very beginning, from, from the apostles that follow Jesus, to you and me today, the, the task that we have been given is to go show the world that the kingdom of God is here. It is us to go present Jesus as the answer in all his power. We're not commanded just to sit at home and to read our Bibles and to pray, although that's good. But we are commanded to go out into the world. When Jesus came to the earth the first time, he came to Israel. Have you ever thought about that? As you, as you think about the life of Jesus, he never left Israel. He stayed in that little bitty country his whole life. When Jesus comes back a second time, the whole world's going to see it. It will be this huge display that every single person in the world will be able to see at the same time. And it will be beautiful. I don't know how many of you have actually spent time recently watching a lightning storm. But they're amazing, aren't they? They're beautiful. They're powerful. They're, they're awe. I mean, when we drive and the kids are in the back and we see lightning in the sky, they go, wow. And it's going to be nothing compared to the return of Christ. The awe, the majesty of it there will be no doubt jesus knew that in the days that followed when he would leave that there would be people that would say i'm the messiah they would say he is the messiah they would say the messiah is coming here and, and this is the time he knew this was coming he talks about it in the rest of the new testament many times false antichrist would pop up in the church jesus knew so that's why he tells us hey don't worry about that if somebody says they're me if somebody says the messiah has come back don't worry about it you'll know when i come it won't be a secret it won't be something that only a handful of people know about. Everyone's going to know when I come back. So don't worry about it. The third thing that Jesus says about the kingdom and his second coming is that Jesus must suffer. He must suffer first. Verse 25. 
But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus' crucifixion was not just some random event in human history. It didn't just happen, but it was planned by God the Father before the foundations of the earth were created that this is my plan to save. The cross had to happen in order for resurrection to happen. And the resurrection had to happen in order for there to be a second coming of Jesus Christ. Fourth, judgment's coming. Verses 26 through 32. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and given into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on that day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. Here Jesus chose two of the most well-known Old Testament stories that spoke of the judgment of God. In Noah's day, the people thought he was crazy. He was building a huge ark. And they probably walked around and mocked him, thinking, this guy's crazy. We're just going to live our lives however we want to live them. They had no concern for the warnings that Noah was giving them. People just wanted to live their lives. Are you just going about your life? Are you not concerned one bit about the warnings of the Bible? Do you have family or friends that have no concern about their spiritual lives? Yeah, you, know, you maybe have invited them to church. Maybe you've tried to have a spiritual conversation with them. And they simply say, I'm not interested. Or they may even get a little upset with you. I am busy. I don't need it. Several years ago, uh, a family moved into our neighborhood. And so uh, Easton and I went to go visit them. They, they, they had a son that was similar in age to Easton. So we were excited. We get the in, the, in the neighborhood. And I remember the first time going up to the house, knocking on the door. They open it. We go in. And we start talking. Very nice couple. And they have a son that was one month older than Easton. Great. As we're talking, getting to know each other, one of the questions I asked is, do you go to church? Because if they didn't go somewhere, wanted to invite them to our church, right? That's what we do, right? And I remember as soon as I asked that question, the temperature in the room changed like that. As they said, you know what, if you're religious, that's cool. Do your thing. We have no interest in any of that. Okay. Over the next several years, we became very good friends with this family. And we would invite them to church, and I would invite him to men's retreats and all of that type of stuff. They never came even once to anything. To this day, we're still friends with these people, but we know that if Christ came back, or if they die, they're going to judgment. And so my prayer is that one day... God will take the seeds that we planted and someone will come along to water them and that God would call it to grow. Because I don't want them to go to judgment. But here's the fact of the matter is they are living their lives. And Jesus just isn't part of it. He's just not interested in having Jesus be part of it. You know, when we look at the story of Sodom, we see the similar things. People living for themselves, doing the things of this world, 
They were not ready when the judgment came because they were too busy. Someone from Sodom, if you interviewed them, they might have said stuff like, I'll worry about my spiritual life after I worry about my career. They might have said, I don't have time for spiritual disciplines because I'm just too busy chasing kids around to all their activities and events. They might have said something like, don't bother me now with this Jesus stuff. I have other things that are simply just more important. Much like Lot's wife, if we're not careful, we can fall in love with the things of this world. We cannot be ready. And when it comes, it's too late. September 11th was a beautiful day. People were getting to the office from dropping their kids off at school. People were in meetings. People were riding elevators. People were checking their emails. People were standing around the coffee pot talking about last night's ball game. Little did they know that in the next few minutes, they would cease to live. They had no idea. They had no idea. See, Jesus has been telling us time and time again that nobody's promised tomorrow. Nobody has promised that there will be a second chance. All the money, all the promotions, all the activities, they will be wasted because we didn't look to the right thing. We didn't look to Jesus. And now there's judgment. And so my question this morning is, are you sure that if today was your last day, you wouldn't be going to judgment. Are you sure of that? Fact number five. Salvation and judgment are individualized. Look at verse 34 and 35. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. One of the hardest things that we as Christians will face is the lostness of someone we love. Husbands will lose wives. Wives will lose husbands. Parents will lose kids. Kids will lose parents. Siblings will be separated from each other. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your sex. It doesn't matter your church attendance. It doesn't matter how good you are. In this world, every one of us will have a decision. Every one of us must place our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. We must place our faith in Jesus' nail pierced hands. You see, folks, there's real consequences for what you do with Jesus. Very real consequences. And so the question is, what do you do with Jesus? Have you confessed him as your Lord and Savior? Have you asked him forgiveness? Have you told him that you want him to save you, to forgive you, to be the Lord of your life? Each and every one of us, each and every one of you sitting here, it is individualized. There's no group packages. Finally, number six. Christ will return when the timing's right. Verse 37. And when they said to him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The disciples were obviously pretty curious. Jesus was talking about judgment, and so they wanted to know when and where this was going to happen so that Jesus used a common saying to the people to help them understand that it was all about timing. Vultures gather when there is a corpse to eat, when the timing is right. Now, for some of you, you hear this saying from Jesus, 
and you don't like it because you're a planner. <laughs> you like to know when and where so I can plan things so that they can happen exactly the way I want them. And more than likely, if you're like most people, get everything done at the last minute. <laughs> The problem is, is that what Jesus has said continually is that you need to listen now. You need to make 100% sure of your destiny right now. Do not wait. Do not think you can live your life however you want to and not prioritize a relationship with Jesus Christ. None of us is promised tomorrow. We must make our number one priority in life. More than our relationship with our spouses, more than our relationship with our kids, more than our relationship with our occupation, our bank account, our number one relationship in our lives should be Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and Jesus is not the Lord and Savior of your life. I'm glad you're here. But my plea to you is that today you fix that. That today you change that. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then my appeal to you today is to tell other people. Don't just sit back and think that, well, they'll just come if they want. No one wants. We must be proactive. We must be intentional about sharing the gospel with other people, sharing with them about Jesus Christ. See, nobody knows when Jesus will return. It could be today. It could be a long time from now. But here's the question. Are you or someone that you love, would they have been somebody in the days of Noah who would have walked around and mocked Noah? As the crazy man. Do you know somebody who in the days of Sodom would have lived in Sodom and went about their lives not worried about anything at the time? What about September 11th? What about October 7th in Israel? What about the families in Gaza today that don't know when the next missile is about to drop on their home or their building and kill them? No one knows when your day, last day will be. Do not wait. We cannot afford to wait. Folks, in the blink of an eye, everything can change. And then you will either be in the kingdom of God with Christ in full realization, or you will be in judgment forever. And so the question, the ultimate question is, will you give your life to Jesus? And if you have, do you love somebody enough to tell them about him so that they can realize it too? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the conviction of it, for the urgency of of it. Lord, I pray that this morning as we sit for a minute and we just let it soak over us, the urgency of this moment, the urgency that no one is promised tomorrow, that in the blink of an eye, things can change. And there's no tomorrow. There's no second chances. It is either heaven or hell. But it's not based on how good we are. It's not based on how religious we are. It's not based on anything other than your grace that we place our faith in. That we place our faith in Jesus Christ as our only hope of forgiveness, of eternal life in heaven with you, of the blessings that we can have. It's not of our own good works. It's not how smart we are. It's by your goodness, that you would choose to love us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would let that sink in on us. I pray that that would just flow over our heads, all the way down to our toes, your goodness, over our lives. 
and the urgency of the message that you have given to your followers. Lord, this morning, if there is anyone here who does not know you, I pray that they would give their lives to you, that they would simply say, Lord Jesus, come, come into my life, forgive me, take control of my life. I want to live for you. I want your forgiveness. I want to follow your commands. And if they do, I pray that they would uh, tell someone, come tell me, tell, tell a friend, tell a family member so that we can celebrate that new life. Lord, if there's anyone here that needs prayer, that they're struggling, that they would be able to come forward and and receive prayer. Lord, for those who are followers of you who want to celebrate this word, your goodness. In the back corners, we have communion available to celebrate your body and your blood. Lord, I just pray that in these moments, whatever needs to happen that people would be willing to do it. If there's confession that needs to be made, repentance that needs to be asked for, if there is anything, if they need to reconcile with a friend or a family, whatever needs to happen this morning, I pray that they wouldn't leave till they've done it. Or because you are worthy of it. If we get nothing else, if we get no more blessings, if, if heaven's gone, if we get you, then that's enough. We just want to see Jesus. We just want to love you and thank you for who you are, even more than what you do, for who you are, God, our creator, our forgiver, our Lord.